Hey everyone, I'm Yukon and welcome to the KTEC Lab. Today we're going to do a quick technical overview of the KTEC RT1. Now before I dive in, I just want to give a quick thanks to the community for your great feedback and your generally extremely positive reception and excitement you've expressed over this project. We're really excited to work with the community, gain some feedback, um, some constructive criticism on few things they want changed and really want to see the next evolution of the system as we iterate in advance in these really cool enclosures. Now before I get started I have to address one quick thing for some of our viewers who may not know what Meshtastic is. To give you a very brief explanation, Meshtastic is essentially a LoRa radio based mesh communicator project. It's completely open source and the capabilities it gives you is absolutely amazing. You can use small compatible LoRa radio boards you can buy from a variety of hardware that's supported and it allows you to have your own encrypted mesh network of multiple radio nodes that you can control and you have complete customization over uh, to whatever application you want and you can pass text messages, uh, geolocation data and some sensor data over the network it's really cool stuff and you should check it out. We personally have been exploring rocketry applications of Meshtastic which is what actually piqued our interest in the first place. Uh, we can use this for uh, range safety management since we can have various geolocation data of personnel. Also it's an alternative communication solution for um, rocketry testing and other development things done out in the field which are usually in areas without the best cell reception and having reliance to cell networks is not always the best thing. Having alternatives like this is absolutely amazing. Now essentially veterans of Meshtastic will know of the ATAC forwarder project. So ATAC is uh, just a really cool software. It's a common operating system where you can pass real-time data and uh, geolocation markers and it's a super capable software usually used by military law enforcement search and rescue it's also used occasionally by outdoors people basically the ATAC forwarder plugin project allows the Meshtastic LoRa radios to act as a relay to relay a limited amount of data through ATAC uh, LoRa radios are limited in bandwidth so it's not super feature rich but it's still a really, really powerful capability to have. So with that in mind, Meshtastic alone is very popular among outdoors people, um, preppers, more off the grid people, or people just interested in electronics like ourselves. But with the Florida project, we have a lot more people who want to put mesh testing and deployed in much more rougher environments which is why we developed the RT1. Now people who know mesh testing and if you don't you should really check out the link below and kind of read through uh, will know that there's various boards that mesh testing is compatible with. Now the rack wireless series of boards are very popular because of their I would argue superior capability because in this tiny form factor you can have much of the same features found in this bigger LilyGo T-Beam board. Uh, it has slightly better performance in some cases. It's completely modular. Um, it's a really cool little system. These boards are cool but newer users don't usually go with this system. They go with the more user friendly T-Beams. T-Beams are not as power efficient and whatnot, but it's kind of an all-in-one solution. You buy the board, it's everything you need, you just need to solder on a small OLED display. It even has a battery tray, so you can pop in a battery, it has a charging circuit. It's a really cool little um, board. And uh, with newer users getting into mesh testing and wanting to deploy this in much more rougher conditions, well, they're most of the time starting out with the T-Beam. So naturally, starting out with the T-beam based enclosure would be the best way to give a solution to the community, to new members of the community. So starting out with the RT1, you can see that it's a three-piece 3D printed body. We have what we call the center frame, which is what holds all the components in the center. 
It's uh, extremely thick. I believe it's about five or six millimeters thick. Uh, I forgot right off the top of my head, even though I designed it. But that frame is really what takes all the impact and protects all the components from the shock it may be subject to. And after that, we have something called the front cover, the front cover and the back cover, which are just two printed covers that screw on top of the center frame and enclose the whole enclosure. Now, between the frame is where water can leak in, which is why uh, more detail on the construction will be uh, addressed in the, in the tutorial video on how to build your own enclosure that's coming next. But just to give you a quick overview, we can either laser cut neoprene rubber as a seal or more simply and more cheaply, you can use RTV silicon sealant. And that's the theme throughout the whole enclosure. Uh, other areas may need some sealing and it's usually silicon sealant or neoprene rubber. So first of all, a uh, big question a lot of people have been asking is the carbon fiber. Now people who know me personally will know that I love carbon fiber. Uh, I have rolls of it in the lab and I make anything I can out of carbon fiber. But there's a practical reason. Number one is reducing weight. Uh, armored plates actually can add a, quite a few more grams and make the device a little heavier. Uh, number two is it's extremely rugged. It's actually armor plating as I like to call it. Now, the front panel has a practical purpose. This carbon fiber panel actually helps the screen protector to be recessed so any kind of uh, more flat objects can't shatter or damage the screen protector or scratch it up. Now on the sides, the, these carbon fiber panels actually have a practical purpose. It's a uh, I like the carbon fiber panels and I like the feel of the slickness, but for people who like a grippier feel, uh, this allows for a drop in replacement of side grips, which you can custom design. Uh, we may release a few in the future. You can even add some rubbery materials and whatnot, and you can do that on both sides. Now in this development version, we removed it on this side, but there in the final version, there'll be two carbon fiber plates on each side that you can replace for whatever material you like. Now moving on to the top, we have a generic micro USB port, um, which is just jumped to the T-beam inside, and it's just running your generic waterproof uh, cap. These are found everywhere. Anyone who's been hunting with for these will know that it's kind of a no-name generic brand, and that's another theme we're going with to make it really easy to source parts. Now next to that is the SMA connector. Uh, in our case, we have the upgraded LoRa antenna that gives us a few more kilometers of range. And this should be able to take other antennas in the future. Now moving on to the back, you can see that the, it says GPS right here. This is space for an upgraded 25 millimeter GPS antenna. Uh, this gives you much better reception, much more stable GPS signals. and it's at an angle below this fairing, which is why we have this angled cutout here. And this ensures a clear view of the sky to take in, to pick up any of the radio signals from our GPS satellites. And the ceramic antenna is inside and protected from the environment as well. Now we got a lot of questions on these two screws in the back. What are they for? Why do we have them? Well, it's for future modularity and upgradability. If you want a belt clip, if you want a vehicle clip, uh, whatever kind of attachment point we want, it's really nice to have a place to upgrade in the future. So we have uh, two heated threaded inserts uh, melted into the plastic itself and two screws to just cover it up. Uh, this was mostly intended for belt clips, but there's a whole variety of other upgrades we can do in the future, which is really cool. Now this is just a small detail. It's not super significant, but I think it's pretty cool, which is we have this kind of chevron cut in accent throughout the whole device up here in the front. Now if you look in the back, there's this flat smooth portion, and that's actually on purpose. It's because this is designed for people who have a whole team of people and you're trying to manage your own LoRa network. 
and you're gonna hand these devices out to each member of your team. Now what ends up happening is devices get mixed up and it's kind of annoying to check and read the node code to know whose is whose. And oftentimes if you see any uh, organization or company or whatever having a bunch of radios, they'll put small labels. And this flat portion is designed just for that. You can put a label out in the back and just check whose radio is what, which is really cool. Now moving on on the interfaces itself, you have two buttons here. Uh, bottom is power, top is the mode. Now this is replicating the push to talk uh, format we are very familiar with with walkie talkies. So you know anyone can pick this up and start using it right away. It's extremely familiar. It's really cool. And moving on to the screen, you can see something slightly different from most T-beam enclosures. So oftentimes, the T-beams have four header pins in a very convenient, uh, the four consecutive pins in a really convenient order that's order to the OLED displays. So oftentimes, you'll see a T-beam with the OLED display sideways soldered directly on the board. Now that's really a good way to get new users started and up and running. The problem we had is OLED displays are extremely fragile and this is designed for rugged environments. A, a strong impact of some sort may not damage the device itself, but it's highly likely the OLED display could crack just from the shock propagating through the device. That's even with a really good shock absorbing body like this. That's always a risk. And if your OLED is solder directly on the T-beam, that's a total hellish experience. If you ever try desoldering header pins, it is a pain. So by jumping the OLED display out with four wires, it gives us two advantages. One, you can rapidly switch out the OLED if it's ever destroyed. And two, it's in an upright position, which is really cool because it really holds that kind of walkie-talkie format and the screen is upright, so that's pretty cool. Now one final quick uh, element on the exterior is the status lights are right below the clear window, which is really cool. It's actually integrated into the screen protector, which is one piece. So enough talk on the outside, let's take a look on the inside. I have my handy screwdriver here and we'll take a look from the top. So you can move these out the way and start taking a look. So four stainless steel screws hold the front panel down. These are all M3 machine screws and we can slowly lift the cover. When we lift the cover we reveal the four silicon jumper wires that hold the screen and you can see the small screen tray that's replaceable in the future and you can see the micro USB that's jumped out to the micro USB enclosure up here and then we have the start to show the T-beam right here in the center and this is what I meant by the five or six millimeter thick center frame it's extremely thick and this is really the secret sauce of the ruggedness of the RTE one. Now in the center frame we have the four brass threaded inserts uh, thread heated and set into the center frame itself. Now we're going to take a look in the back Now, once again if you have any questions regarding the internals and stuff I believe most of them will be answered in the tutorial video on assembling your own RT1. So the back also comes clear very easily. The four screws. And we'll lift the back. The back is really cool. So the GPS antenna is mounted right underneath here, which is why it's hard to lift the back. This is the cool part. Check this out. Two twenty one seven hundred cells. That's right, two twenty one seven hundred cells. The T beam can hold one eighteen six fifty and the maximum capacity of eighteen six fifty I believe is 
3,500 milliamp hours. Well, with the 21700, you can get up to 5,000 milliamp hours. So with two 21700 cells, you can have up to 10,000 milliamp hours. And that's absolutely nuts. With 10,000 milliamp hours, the battery life on the, your T-beam would be like many, many days. Since on a single 18650 and with optimized settings, you can get up to three days on average. With 10,000 milliamp hours, this should be enough for most missions. And it's really been designed to hold a big battery. Now, I hope this quick technical overview of the RT-1 was uh, educational or at the very least entertaining and I hope it answers some of your questions I can't wait for the next video where we're gonna build another one and show you the whole steps uh, one by one so you can replicate it and build your own RT one at home now in terms of later iterations of this we've already gotten tremendous amounts of feedback on small design changes people would like and we're really excited to uh, show you the next version that we've been slowly working on. It will have things like detachable batteries, a better GPS antenna, and a better ergonomic, and it will be a far more capable device following the same form factor. Now I hope you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you next time.